So, um, welcome to our postgraduate talk event. Um, we are surrounded by an amazing bunch of academics and postgraduate students, as well as undergraduate students who are prospective postgraduate students um, and those that fall everywhere in between. Um, so, yes, just quickly some house rules and disclaimers, as we always do. Um, so please keep yourself muted until it's appropriate. So after the main talk, if you have questions and no one is speaking, you may unmute yourself for that. Um, so yeah, but other than that, please try to keep yourself muted to respect the speakers. Um, you can have your video on or off. It's up to you. Um, the event is being recorded. So if your video is on, just know that you may end up on the recording, but if not, then everything should be fine. Um, and the recording will be made available on our website and respectively on YouTube. Um, they go hand in hand with each other. Um, so if you need to leave at any point, please do so quietly. You don't have to write in the chat. Um, maybe a quick thank you is fine, but don't unmute yourself or anything like that. Um, sort of basic etiquette. Um, and if you have any questions, please keep them from the chat until the Q&A session. Um, after Sergei's speech, we'll have a very quick Q&A session regard just relating to what he's given. So you can obviously send questions in for that section. But if you have other questions, try to hold them off until the question and answer session. Um, so the talk should last, oh, not one, and a, one hour, 15 minutes. Um, no, the talks will last one hour, 15 minutes, give or take. Um, and then the rest will be for questions. Um, if we spend a bit longer uh, on questions, you can leave either exactly at the end or you can leave um, at the o'clock. So you can leave whenever you want to. Um, so now introductions. First off, um, us, just quickly, the association, who are we, the UVC CAS. Um, so I say this at every presentation because we may have different people um, joining us. So our aim is to unite students around the UK, um, undergraduate students in particular, um, and we try to help people with their academic, their professional, and the social sort of um, progression. <laughs> um, and yeah, we try to just encourage and foster as much undergraduate talent as we can in the fields of Slavonic, Eastern European, Central Asian studies um, and everything that falls in between. Um, we plan to have an event every month. So this is this month's event. Um, and our next events will be academic discussions for undergraduates in November and a careers talk in December. It'll be slightly similar to this, but obviously the focus is different. Um, and in semester two, we will have more, um, including an in-person conference. So do stay tuned for that. Um, everything is listed on our website following this link, um, sort of circular logic. You can access the slides on our website and then that will take you to our website. Um, so without further ado, let me quickly just introduce everybody. So at first we have Dr. Sergei Bogatryev. I hope I pronounced it okay. Um, so he's an associate professor at the professor at the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies at the University College London. His research interests lie in the history of family memory in the Kievan Rus, the history and culture of Muscovite Russia, book culture and technology transfer. He's on the editorial boards of several academic journals and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He's contributed a chapter to Ivan the Terrible to the Cambridge History of Russia. Um, his article on the patronage of early printing in Muscovy won a prize of the Early Slavonic Studies Association. And more of his career works can be found here. Um, there's so much more. I was researching Sergei's profile recently, and it's just incredible the work that he does. So I really encourage you to check it out. Um, Dr. Rachel Platonov, I hope I got the stress right, <laughs> um, is a teacher of 19th and 20th century Russian literature and culture, both undergraduate and postgraduate, including master's and PhD supervision. Um, she's received her doctor doctorate from Harvard University and bachelor's from Yale. Her teaching and research interests include Soviet history, mass culture and propaganda of the mid 1900s. She's the author of the book, Singing the South, Guitar Poetry, Community and Identity in, post in the Post-Stalin Period. And again, more of her career can be found here. She's published much, much more than the book here, but I thought it would be cool to in introduce this book because it seems very interesting. And finally, not finally, um, Dr. Sarah Hudspeth. She cannot be with us today. We do have a recording that she's prepared for us though. And if you do have questions for her, then we can give you her contacts at the end. 
Um, so she's an associate professor in Russian at the University of Leeds, graduated with a master's in Russian and Czech studies from Bristol. Um, she's a member of the Basis and International Dostoevsky Association. Her areas of expertise include 19th and 21st, 19th to 21st century Russian literature, including Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, um, world literatures, globalization, canon formation, culture and national identities, and much, much more. Um, along with many articles and chapters, she's also published two books, Russian Culture in the Age of Globalization and Dostoevsky and the Idea of Russianness. So um, I hope you will check out her um, profile as well. So much interesting stuff. Um, and finally, we have Alana Miller. Um, she studied Russian studies and English literature at the University of Edinburgh for her undergraduate degree. Uh, that's where I am right now, so it has a special place in my heart. Um, during her undergraduate, she specialised in Russian literature and Northern Irish poetry. And she's currently studying international peace studies at Trinity College Dublin with a specialist in a specialism in Russian and the Russian space. Um, and as you will see, she has a very interesting future ahead. So over to the speakers. This is the quick order that everything will run in. So we'll have Dr. Sergei Bakaterev speak first for 15 minutes. Then we will have a Q&A just dedicated to his presentation because he needs he may need to leave slightly early. Um, and then after that, we will have um, Dr. Rachel Platonov for 15 minutes, roughly. Um, we will show you what Sarah has prepared for us, and then we'll have Alana. And then after everything, we'll have the question and answers. So as I said earlier, if you do have questions, please keep them from the chat until the Q&A session or segment begins. Um, and that is me finished. So I will not talk for the rest of the event um, unless I have questions. So over to Sergei. Thank you very much, Matthew. So, typical question. Can you see the slide? Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, I'm Sergei Bogatyrev, um, Associate Professor at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London. I'm also program coordinator for CIS history this year. And thank you very much to UBASICS for inviting me to tell about graduate studies at UCL CIS. So UCL is among I would say the best universities in the world. Uh, as you can see from this chart, we are officially on number eight. I think it should be actually on num uh, number seven, because you usually have seven after six. There are uh, two institutions sharing the sixth place. But anyway, so here we are, uh, officially eighth in the world, uh, fourth in Europe and fourth in the UK. And um, University College London is uh, located um, at the heart of London in Bloomsbury. Um, and uh, this uh, aerial view hopefully gives you some idea about our location. Uh, can you see my point to moving around UCL? Very yes, good. Yeah. So this is where uh, UCL is. And uh, as you can see, the British Museum is literally around the corner, BBC, a bit further away, the House of Parliament, uh, Royal Courts of Justice, cities here. Uh, so uh, it is superb, very central location in London. Um, UCL is also perfectly connected across the globe. So here you have some statistics, uh, 350,000 uh, alumni of UCL work in about 200 countries, um, about 30, uh, over 30% actually of uh, UCL staff is international staff and over half of our students are international students and we have uh, partnerships with uh, institutions and organizations around the world. And within UCL, this huge 
global university. We have what I would describe as a sort of convenient, uh, convenient size uh, department, which is the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, SEAS. Uh, here we have some facts about SEAS. It was established in 1915 in the middle of the First World War. Uh, and uh, the School of Slavonic and East European Studies joined UCL in 1999. Um, CIS is the largest academic unit in the United Kingdom, dedicated to study of the region. Uh, we have over 1,100 students and uh, 100 of staff. Uh, as you can see here, we have numerous BA degrees, MA degrees, uh, and research degrees, and we also have a PhD program. Um, our library is absolutely superb. It won uh, awards, uh, and um, it contains over 400,000 books, journals, uh, and also uh, our library is very strong on film studies, so it has superb collection of film resources. Well, I already showed you where UCL and CIS is located, and uh, apart from museums and uh, various political institutions, uh, we also have numerous libraries around us, including the British Library, uh, UCL Library. So uh, in terms of library resources, you will be perfectly supported if you decide to do uh, MA studies with us. So why? to do MA studies uh, at SEAS. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, SEAS is a relatively small uh, department uh, within a huge university. And in this sense, you would get the best of both worlds. So you will be 100% UCL student. You will have access to all UCL resources, to everything UCL has to offer but you will also have a home within seas. And um, our programs are specialist. So you will get to know our academics very closely, your fellow students, um, our fantastic administrative um, staff. Um, we organize numerous events uh, for students at seas. Um, we offer history, literature, language, and culture modules. Uh, they are usually taught in small groups. Uh, and this means that you will have a lot of uh, attention from module tutors. You will be also interacting with uh, your module tutors. And you will get a chance to uh, become familiar with their research. And it is very important because we are a research active department. So you will be taught by people who wrote textbooks, which you will probably be reading for your modules, uh, people who wrote monographs, who will be on, which will be on your bibliography. Um, so our MA students uh, have access to a wide range of modules. I'll speak briefly about our modules in a minute. Um, so there are great benefits of being uh, in a multidisciplinary department like SEAS. And of course, if you want uh, to go outside history degree, so you can take modules in um, literature, languages, uh, so you can study all aspects of uh, Eastern Europe or Russia, uh, from politics and economy to history and culture. And uh, knowledge of the region is in demand. Um, so when you graduate uh, with the CSMA, uh, you will immediately have something very important on your CV. Uh, and your CV will stand out. And in terms of possible careers, so here uh, you have a list of uh, various opportunities, including charities, 
uh, international and non-government organizations, publishing, journalism, translation, policy and government. Um, so um, our graduates go on to varied careers, as you can see from this list, uh, because they have specialist knowledge uh, and uh, we are often approached by organizations uh, in need uh, of graduates with the languages and expertise we teach at CES. Um, and uh, our alumni can be found in different roles. Um, so recent graduates, for example, have worked in journalism, translation, media, education, and government. And CES organizes various career events for uh, students, uh, I apologize for the noise. It's one of the benefits of being in central London. It's, it can be quite noisy. Um, so um, we have uh, alumni coming uh, back to CES and telling uh, students uh, about career opportunities. And uh, we have hosted organizations like Chatham House, Foreign Commonwealth Office and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So uh, this is an overview of graduate programs we are offering at CES. Uh, so uh, we have MA in History, Economics and Business, Politics and Sociology, Languages, Literature and Culture, uh, international Masters in Economy, State and Society. This is a two-year program and the second year is year abroad when students go to our partner institutions uh, in the region. Plus, uh, we have two uh, master research degrees. Uh, it is uh, M. RES in East European Studies and um, RES in Politics Economics of Eastern Europe. And we have also uh, a very extensive PhD program. So if you are thinking about continuing your studies uh, after your MA degree, that would be a very good opportunity. I can say all my, MA, uh, all my PhD students came actually uh, through our uh, MA program. Uh, I will now focus on one of our programs. Well, I would say it's the best of our programs, but I'm, of course, biased because I'm from CS History, and this is CS MA History program. So here you have uh, the original coverage of our program, and as you can see, it's huge. Uh, it covers uh, the political, social, cultural, intellectual history of Central and Eastern Europe, and we include Germany and Russia. And uh, the regional coverage of our program is unique uh, and very broad. So as you can see, uh, it includes the area of the former Soviet Union. And if you can visualize the map of the former Soviet Union, it means we cover Siberia, Central Asia, through the Caucasus and the Baltic countries. Um, we also include Finland. Uh, in Eastern Europe, we certainly look at Poland. Um, our Central European countries uh, include Austria. And uh, in the southeast part of our region, we have the Balkans, of course. And uh, there is a historical reason for uh, such a broad coverage. Um, well, I'm a historian. I can't miss an opportunity to sort of give you a very brief introduction to the history of seas. As I mentioned, it was established in 1915 by... Um, uh, Thomas Basharik, who was a very prominent uh, Czech politician and philosopher. And uh, he argued that uh, after the First World War, three great empires would collapse. That would be the Habsburg Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire. And uh, his argument was that the UK would need um, an institution for studying this successor states. And uh, 
he managed to persuade the British government. Well, the British government also needed spies who would knew the languages of the region. So as usually there are different factors contributing to the appearance of seas in 1915. And this is why uh, you have such sort of diverse uh, set of countries like Finland, Poland, uh, Austria, the Balkans, because all these states uh, were parts of these three empires in the past. So uh, if we um, think about the importance of the region, uh, so um, chronologically we cover the period from the late uh, 15th century to the 19th and 20th century. And uh, Central and Eastern Europe is of course essential for our understanding of many historical developments and also contemporary politics. Uh, many global events started in our region. Uh, I already mentioned the First World War. The Second World War also started uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, the Russian Revolution took place, uh, of course, in the Russian Empire. And all these events had a profound global impact. Um, so if we look at sort of the main themes uh, covered in our program. So I mentioned uh, the Russian Habsburg and Ottoman Empire. We'll also look at the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, the German Empire and uh, successor states. But it, it's not only about wars and violence. We also look at other very important um, issues like the rise of nationalism in the 19th century, modernization, transition to democracy after the collapse of the communist bloc. And also, well, our region includes arguably the most beautiful cities in the world, like Prague, Vienna, Budapest. So we have courses on architecture, arts, urbanization, but we look at these topics from uh, a history perspective, of course. Uh, so, um, here we have um, a sample list of our modules. Now, I should mention that not all modules run each academic year because, uh, well, as usually uh, colleagues go on research leave or sometimes they receive additional administrative uh, jobs. Uh, so final confirmation of modules usually uh, take place at the start of the academic year. But here you have, for example, uh, the history of Berlin, uh, the crisis zone, Central Europe, 1900 to 1990, the Soviet Union's Cold War. Uh, we have a module, Little Hitler's question mark, right, radicalism in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Russian monarchy, court ritual and political ideas. This is my module. Uh, and we also have modules in politics, sociology, culture and languages. And uh, speaking of languages, here you can see a selection of languages we offer. And CIS um, is unique in the number of languages uh, it offers from the region. Uh, so I think it's unrivaled anywhere else in the UK, but again, I may be biased. Um, so you can take different levels uh, and uh, our classes are usually quite small. Uh, so we have dedicated language uh, teachers. Uh, we have plenty of opportunities uh, for practicing outside uh, the classroom. So when there are different events like poetry readings, book launches, film screenings, film studies is a very uh, important component of our program. Uh, so all our MA uh, programs allow uh, students to select a language. Uh, and as you can see from the list, uh, well, obviously we have a wide selection of Slavic languages, but also we have Estonian and Finnish, for example. Um, so I hope you will be able to find uh, suitable uh, and interesting and useful language. Um, also, your studies will be supported by 
various events uh, and there are so many things happening at seas. It's sometimes even sort of difficult to uh, follow the timetable of our events. Uh, we have numerous centers dedicated to studying particular areas like uh, the Center for the Study of Central Europe, the Center for South and East European Studies, the Center for Russian Studies, um, and so on. Um, and students usually have many opportunities to get involved. We have a um, student-led journal called Slova Word, and I'm the academic lead uh, for the journal. Uh, but most of the work is done by the students themselves, so they um, have an editorial board, and it's, it's a very uh, sort of exciting uh, activity if you are interested in journalism, if you want to practice in preparing publications, editorial work. Um, we also have a post-Soviet press group uh, where you research and report back on stories happening across the region. And as you know, there are many events happening in the region, including tragic events like the Ukrainian war. Uh, so we... Uh, discuss current events in the region. Uh, there is a forum called uh, CSEING, it's S-S-E-E-S-ING, uh, and uh, this is where uh, CIS uh, academics, students, and invited experts, uh, guest speakers discuss various events. So we recently uh, hosted panels on uh, women's rights in Poland, uh, the Belarus, protests and the war in Ukraine. So here we have some useful links and outlets where uh, you can reach us. I uh, posted uh, the uh, presentation to the organizers, so I hope uh, you can access it. So you can register your interest on the UCL website to receive information on upcoming events and relevant program information. So here you have uh, the link uh, sees specific online sessions will be running in November. And you, again, you can use this link to register for the SEAS uh, events. Now, of course, we are on uh, social media and we have our brilliant dedicated admission team, which can be reached at this email. So it's MA admission at cs.ucl.ac.uk. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Sidgi. Um, I think just as we wait for the questions to come rolling in, I'd like to quickly say that that was extremely thorough, very informative and very uh, well, I want to study that. <laughs> so uh, you've you've done a That's, very good that job. was the whole idea. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank um, you very much. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> yes, and I would also like to um, just note that I think UCL does offer the widest range of Slavic language, uh, sorry, Eastern European languages. Um, and I guess the question I have, as we wait for others to come in, um, these languages can you study them ab initio as a master's student? Uh, I think you can. Yes, I think you can. I would uh, suggest that you double check with our admission team, but uh, I think you should be able to do that. Yes. Oh, okay. That sounds nice. <laughs> I'm just going to follow on Instagram now, just because um, before I forget to. <laughs> We'll wait to maybe 10, 15 seconds. And if there are no questions, then maybe we can move on to Rachel. Um, but otherwise, um, if nobody has questions, then yeah, we maybe shall move on. Um, but once again, thank you very much for the speak. It was Thank excellent. you very much thank for you, yes. having me. Thank you. I will stay around for a while and then okay. quietly disappear as you instructed. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, just to Rachel. say, Go for just it, to say, 
Um, if anyone does has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and feel free to put questions throughout the presentations and we'll get back to you. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, as well as the fact that I'll hand it over to Rachel, I think. <laughs> right, thank you very much. It's a hard act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, let me just share this. And... Is it the same color screen as last time? <laughs> no, it's changed. I it's, thought so. <laughs> I, I'm all about the variety. Um, <laughs> so I've taken a bit of a different approach um, from Sergei. I will be talking about specific MA opportunities at Manchester, but I also wanted to provide a sense of the vast range of pathways that recent Manchester graduates have gone down in terms of further study and the kinds of opportunities that this, this then opens up for career pathways. And as I was thinking about this presentation, I started considering what I remembered about students' interests when they were at Manchester. And I noticed some interesting patterns developing with, for example, those who had been particularly interested in the language itself in Russian and in Polish and sometimes other languages that, that they were studying alongside these tended to go on when they went into further study to translation and interpreting to intercultural communication, whereas students who were typically more interested in culture and history, these kinds of subjects would go on into further study of modern languages and cultures, sometimes programs not at, at CEC even or programs other institutions across the UK as well as at Manchester itself. Um, those with an interest in polit politics and or area studies tended to go on to further study of international relations, of security studies, and quite a lot into journalism. And finally, those with an interest in, in uh, business focus would not surprisingly go on to further study in fields like international business and international management. And what I found so interesting about doing this kind of mapping was that it demonstrates just how versatile and just how powerful the undergraduate degrees that you're studying now are and just the wide range of career opportunities, postgraduate study opportunities they open up, which I think can't really be stressed enough. Um, given my background and my interests, the areas that I focus on are around translation and interpreting intercultural communication and modern languages and cultures. So I'll say a little bit about each of those degrees in turn with a little bit of a focus on how it is that someone like me contributes to these programs. So the first program that I want to talk about is a taught MA in translation and interpreting studies, which has a broad focus on the theory and the practice of translation. And um, the University of Manchester can cater for any language combination with English. So we have students who are translating from Russian to English, and that's part of where I get involved. But we have loads of other different language combinations as well, including languages, um, other languages from the region like Polish, like Ukraine and these sorts of things. Um, there's a wide range of specialisms catered for on this taught MA, including things like commercial translation, audiovisual translation, interpreting for business and institutions, transcreation, that is the process of adapting a message from one language to another with uh, an emphasis on maintaining the intention, the style, the tone, and the context, but providing it with a new life in a new linguistic and cultural setting. Um, the Translation and Interpreting Studies MA provides excellent preparation both for careers in the languages sector and for further study, including doctoral study. And many of the graduates of this program have found employment with UN agencies, with translators without borders, with uh, capital translation and interpreting, other translation agencies around the UK and around the world, as well as in universities around the UK and around the world. As Pardon me. The structure of the structure of the MA in translation and interpreting studies is as follows. Two thirds of the program is devoted to taught course units, which focus on topics like um, 
like introduction to translation and interpreting studies, translating for business and institutions, translating for culture, uh, for creative and heritage in industries and multilingualism and language policy, which focuses on developing a basic understanding of concepts like multilingualism, language ideologies, language policies and planning, um, key theories related to these kinds of concepts. So what a course like multilingualism and language policy aims to do is provide students with an understanding of how language policy is interconnected to constructing nations, constructing imagined communities, the ways in which language policy shapes and impacts multilingualism, multilingualism both individually and socially. So two thirds of the MA in translation and interpreting studies is devoted to taught course units. The remaining third is devoted to a, a dissertation that can either be research based or practical. Um, the majority of students on the translation and interpreting program do practical dissertations that focus on things like subtitling assignments um, or translation of an analysis of an aircraft safety manual from Russian into English, which is a project that I supervised not so many years ago. I supervised an incredibly interesting dissertation a couple of years ago on subtitling once upon a time in Odessa that not only involved subtitling a portion of that dissertation, but also looking at the ways in which streaming platforms can be used to provide additional cultural content and cultural context for viewers who are interested in delving deeper into a background of a series that might not be familiar to them. Um, additional practical dissertation projects that have been supervised by other staff in translation and interpreting studies include one on translating humor and offensive language, translating and analyzing popular science articles, um, translating um, su and subtitling of honorific speech in a South Korean drama, for example. So there's a really broad range of projects that people do for practical dissertations and for research dissertations. Um, dissertations in recent years have focused on register and legal translation or a case study of the use of interpreters at a Greater Manchester Care Leaving Service. So there's an awful lot that can be done with that independent study and supervision component of the, of the Mattis degree. Where I get involved, particularly with this degree program, in addition to supervising dissertation research, is in the Mattis language specific tutorials, pardon me, I'm having a little bit of difficulty with my controls here. There we go, with the language specific tutorials. These tutorials are embedded into the taught course units and combine a range of topics um, such as translation of culturally specific references, language variation, humor, offensive language, um, the, the language specific tutorials are run as workshops focusing on a specific piece of translation work, either literary or audiovisual, and the kinds of choices and decisions that student translators make as they work through these translation projects. They also involve the opportunity to talk about kinds of alternatives for translation of different aspects of these texts, the decision making process, and the kinds of factors that influence us as translators of particular texts and types of texts. The taught MA in intercultural communication is sort of a sister to the translation and interpreting studies MA, but whereas the translation and interpreting studies one focuses on language per se and on translation and interpreting as professional activities, the intercultural communication MA focuses on the cultural complexity and diversity in modern society. And there's a very wide range of topics for study, again, including language contact, English as a global language, the media. Like the Mattis degree, it provides a preparation for a career in the languages sector and or for doctoral study. The structure of this MA program, again, is um, 
two thirds taught course units and one third dissertation with the taught course units, including things like foreign language for intercultural competence, which involves actual language learning of any one of the languages that's taught within the School of Arts, Languages and Cultures at Manchester with supervised study of intercultural competence and autonomous and systematic critical reflection on the foreign language learning experience. A course like English as a Global Language introduces and problematizes the concept of global language, looking at the history, current situation, and future evolution of English as a Global Language. And it's focused very much on teasing out the nature of the problems associated with this concept. The course unit that I'm most heavily involved in on the internet on the intercultural communication MA is popular music and identity, which stems from my background studying um, studying what I like to refer to as Russian hippie music. Um, the uh, dissertation component of the MA in intercultural communication, again, can have a practical component as well as a theoretical one with recent dissertations exploring intercultural perspectives in diversity training manuals, intercultural training programs for international students in the UK, but also subjects like the representation of Vietnam Vietnamese women in French language film or intercultural communicative competence as developed in Chinese universities, for example. The taught course units on the MA in intercultural communication tend to be team taught and bring together scholars and students from different disciplines to illuminate both broad concepts and specific issues. So the one I mentioned earlier, popular music and identity, focuses on cultural identity and popular, popular music using a variety of different case studies, including flamenco, yay rock in 1960s France, rap music resistance and criminal justice in the US, protest songs of the January 2011 revolution in Egypt, and my contribution, which focuses on guitar poetry, Avtorskaya Pesnya, semi-underground singer-songwriter genre that arose uh, in the Soviet Union in the post-Stalin period. Finally, the last uh, MA that I contribute to is the MA in uh, modern languages and cultures itself. Again, a taught MA that combines embedded research training theories and methods training with a broad range of geographical and conceptual areas of study. It has the same structure as the other two MAs I've already mentioned, two thirds taught course units, one third dissertation. But with this MA, there's much more of a focus on independent study, supervised research and writing, because this tends to provide students with preparation for doctoral study. The students who go on to this MA tend to be interested in pursuing a PhD, for example, though it does also prepare students for for work in the arts and cultural sectors. So the taught course components of the MA in modern languages and cultures include things like research essays, but also specialist course units focusing on, for example, culture, media, and politics in the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Russia, culture and society in Germany um, between 1871 and 1918. Some of the recent dissertations that are relevant to study of the region um, that we're discussing today include dissertations on veterans, narratives and nation building in Putin's Russia, Moldavian and Romanian popular music by women and the femme fatale and the adaptation thereof to Bolshevik ideology in the Red Pinkerton novels of the 1920s. I get involved with dissertation supervision on the MA Modern Languages and Cultures, but I also get involved working on the research essays with students, which are effectively guided reading units whereby a supervisor such as myself meets closely with a student for over the course of a single semester, building up a profile of reading a research question that the student then designs and completes an essay project around. And this involves application of research and conceptual skills that are developed on some of the other taught course units, as well as the close reading and discussion of specific materials that are relevant to the particular project in question. 
one of the recent projects that I supervised was on how Eastern European countries present them in the Eurovision Song Contest, for example, in which the student analyzed specific entries to Eurovision um, and analyzed aspects of music and performance as well as lyrics to build up an argument about how it is that specific Eastern European countries construct a particular identity for the Eurovision Song Contest. Any one of these MA programs provides preparation for careers uh, in a range of different sectors involving languages and cultures. They also all provide preparation for postgraduate research. And we have had students go on to postgraduate degrees in a wide range of areas, including history, interpreting studies, Russian and East European studies, translation and intercultural studies, both in cases where they're interested in a career in academia, but also in cases where they're interested in careers in fields like education or publishing, the public sector, think tanks, and so on and so forth. And to pick up on a point that Sergei made earlier, the knowledge of the languages, cultures, societies, politics, history of the region that we're discussing and that we're all invested in um, is very much in demand. And so both in the public sector and in the private sector, um, there will be organizations and institutions out there that want specialists, that want the kind of expertise that you are building now and that you can continue to build further through postgraduate study at, at master's level and even at PhD level if you choose. To give an idea of some of the routes into PhDs, there are commonly three different ways that students get into, um, get funding for PhDs and, uh, and are able to uh, study at PhD programs either at Manchester or elsewhere in the UK. One of these is known as the one plus three route. And what this involves is typically uh, one of the major national funding bodies such as the AHRC or ESRC. Um, providing funding for a master's, that's the one, and then a three-year PhD program as well. So it's a four-year package of funding typically um, that allows the student to develop an academic profile um, through the course of a master's degree that then builds into a PhD. So again, not unlike what Sergei was mentioning earlier with most of his PhD students having done master's degrees at CIS. Uh, it is also possible for students to apply by an independent route, that is a student who is doing a master's degree anywhere in the UK, anywhere in the world, who finds a supervisor with relevant expertise at the University of Manchester or at another institution um, in the UK, could approach that supervisor with a research proposal um, and develop that proposal into an independent application for a place on a PhD program and for funding to support that. The final route for PhD um, programs commonly is a project-based route whereby a researcher such as Sergei or Sarah might have a major grant to which they had funding for a specific PhD on a specific topic that was related to their broader project. Um, and typically these positions are advertised and people are invited to apply to do a PhD on a specific aspect of research that is part of a larger project led by a principal investigator like Sergei or Sarah, for example. Some of the past PhD projects that I've been involved in have spanned a really broad range of topics. And this list is abbreviated, but it gives you an idea of just how diverse the range of PhD opportunities out there is. Um, as you might imagine, the supervision sessions for supervising a PhD on the function of Russian obscene language in late Soviet and post-Soviet prose got quite spicy at times because we had to discuss nuances of translation of Russian obscene language for the purposes of research. Um, I've also supervised PhDs on topics like um, online gaming, massively multi multiplayer online RPGs in post-Soviet Russia, on women and martyrdom in post-Soviet cinema. I've been involved in uh, working on PhD projects on conflict reporting following 9-11 and the Cold War, comparing 
the way in which um, Russian news media and British news media reported one and the same conflict. I've been involved in supervising PhDs on propaganda posters in Soviet Uzbekistan and on the memory and commemoration of the V.I. Lenin monument in post-Soviet Riga, for example. So there's really a vast range of topics that one can choose to write on, whether these are attached to a specific project, as I mentioned with the project-based route, or developed based on specific interests that um, an individual student might have. And the limit there is really um is really up to your imagination i think i think the best answer to that question is um that is the end of my talk i'll put my email address up in case anyone wants to email me questions after the talk but with that i will uh, turn over turn back over to matthew um, for the lead into sarah's contribution Thank you very much for the talk. I know it's quite dark in my room at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Very informative once again. And I really appreciate that you've put all of the courses that you're that are relevant to your expertise. Um, there was so much. I, I wish I was taking notes, but yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so Sarah, um, Francesco, do you want to share Sarah's um, video? Do you have it on you? Excellent. Okay, so yeah, Sarah knew that she wouldn't be able to um, be a part of this talk today, but she still wanted to contribute. Therefore, she's given us a pre-recorded presentation. Hello, I'm Sarah Hudspeth. I'm an associate professor in Russian at uh, University of Leeds, and uh, I'm going to spend a, a few minutes uh, telling you about uh, possibilities of postgraduate research degrees. There are various type of postgraduate research degrees. Um, there are uh, masters by research, which might be um, uh, have a qualification abbreviated to MAR or MRES. There is the master of philosophy, uh, and there is also the doctor of philosophy, uh, which is uh, mostly abbreviated to PhD, but at Oxford University is called a DPhil. And the master's by research degree is the uh, the lowest level um, of, of research degree um, and the PhD is the highest level um, with the MPhil uh, coming in between. I'm going to spend this presentation mostly talking about PhDs. Um, the expectations for MAs by research and for MPhils um, you can consider uh, therefore to be uh, uh, slightly less than um, what I'm going to outline in relation to uh, in relation to PhD study. So first of all, what is a PhD? What's involved? Uh, when you undertake a PhD, uh, you set about uh, carrying out an independent research project. This is a project um, that uh, that you design and that you lead and pursue and uh, um, investigate and write up. Um, the duration is typically three to four years. Most institutions uh, will enroll you for three years and uh, full time and uh, will allow um, a fourth year for, for writing up. In the course of this project, you produce a thesis, um, which is typically around 100,000 words um, for the arts and humanities. Um, the lengths um, will vary from institution to institution, but um, uh, uh, on average, I would say they're typically um, 80,000 to 100,000 words. In conducting your project, uh, you will be supported by at least one PhD supervisor. Um, many institutions operate a policy of co-supervision. So um, in those places, you would have uh, maybe two supervisors, occasionally three. Um, this is in order to give you um, a, a, a good safety net and a, a, a good um, breadth of expertise that can feed into your, into your project. A PhD is examined at the end of um, the, the term, at the end of the, uh, the, the three year, four year term um, by submitting your thesis, um, which is read by your examiners. Your examiners are different from your supervisors. Uh, and um, then they will uh, um, talk to you about your thesis during a Viva Voce exam, uh, which is, 
I suppose kind of like an interview. Um, the examiners will will discuss your project with you, um, question you about it and invite you essentially to defend the arguments that you're putting forward in it. PhDs are judged um, essentially on criteria uh, that, um, depending on the wording between different institutions, are likely to be looking for something um, around the following. Originality, in other words, it's got to be something that um, no one else has, um, has written on before. Um, you have to demonstrate independent critical ability and the thesis has to contain matter suitable for publication. As I say, these criteria do vary slightly from institution to institution, um, but they are um, largely um, broadly expressing the same kind of things. For the lower level research degrees, um, MPhil and MA by research, um, what is usually um, taken out for those things is the, um, the importance of originality. Um, so um, they will be defined slightly differently. Why might you want to do a PhD? Uh, well, um, you might find that at the end of your undergraduate studies um, and um, indeed if you go on to do a, a taught master's program, um, this may lead you to discover that there is simply more to be said about a particular topic um, that you are passionate about. Um, it does need to be a subject that you are passionate about, that you have a really deep um, and motivating interest in because it's got to sustain you um, for the three or four years um, that you'll be working on it. Um, and um, so it's about being able to, um, to sort of uh, from the understanding that you already have, be able to think, well, hmm, nobody's really talked about this. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps perhaps I could be the one to uh, to work on that. Um, so this is about um, wanting to be part of an academic uh, conversation and being able to make a contribution to that to that conversation uh, by pushing forward the boundaries of what people already know about a subject. And this enables you to uh, to become an expert. So uh, the relationship um, between supervisors and PhD students is a far more equal one uh, than, um, than, than between undergraduates and their tutors. Uh, so it's very often the case that uh, supervisors learn as much from their, uh, their, their PhD students as, um, as PhD students do from their supervisors. It becomes um, quite a mutually uh, um, uh, um, inspiring and, uh, um, and developmental relationship. Um, so it's good to have that kind, that kind, that kind of footing where where you are are very much um, treated as um, much more of an intellectual equal. Uh, what might a PhD lead to? Uh, well, if you're intending to go into a career in academia, then a PhD is essential. Um, if you um, if you find that um, you, you've, um, you, when you've written your thesis, um, that um, there are aspects of it that um, could actually um, be produced as a book or as articles, uh, then uh, many uh, people do go on to do that and, uh, and, and publish parts of their work. So if you have an aspiration to see your name in print, uh, then uh, doing a PhD can, um, can help with that. Um, but there are um, there are ways in which uh, a PhD can support um, other careers outside of, of academia as well. Anything that requires um, demonstrating um, extended um, uh, intensive research skills and the, the ability to communicate that research clearly um, to uh, to various audiences, whether in writing or um, you know in through through presentations and so on, um, then um, a PhD can be helpful for that. Um, particularly in any area that um, requires a, a sort of an expert level of knowledge. Um, and for example, in, um, in, in Russian, Eurasian or East European studies, um, then these are very much welcomed in organisations such as the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, um, think tanks such as Chatham House um, and any other um, NGOs or, or independent think tanks that undertake research um, in and to the particular um, areas or parts of the world that you're interested in. How do you go about identifying um, a project 
that uh, you would like to develop into uh, into a PhD? Uh, well, the the best piece of advice um, to start off um, with is reading, just simply reading as much as you can around your topic. Get a good sense of what's already been written, um, what kind of questions are being asked about the things that you're interested in, and this will gradually um, help you to identify where there might be areas that you could um, uh, make an original contribution. And within this, think about the scholars that inspire you. Um, whose uh, approaches do you enjoy most? Um, whose uh, publications do you find um, most appealing um, and most, most interesting to, to read? Um, use this not only to identify approaches and possible uh, projects, but also who might be a potential supervisor. So once you have an idea, then a good thing to do is to start contacting potential supervisors. Um, most academics have um, a profile um, on their institutional websites, which talks about areas that they're happy to supervise um, PhD students in. Um, see if you can find a good match, get in touch with them, uh, tell them about your ideas and uh, and then uh, most academics will be happy to um, engage in a little bit of um, support with developing a proposal, reading drafts and so on um, before you submit those as a formal application to an in to a particular institution. A few practicalities to be aware of. Um, PhD study um, costs money. There are obviously fees to pay and um, living expenses that you need to find. Um, most um, most institutions also expect you in the arts and humanities, at least, to already have a master's degree. So if you are, um, are interested in PhD study, then think about master's programmes um, that might help to, um, to, to provide the appropriate springboard onto um, postgraduate study that are sort of in the kind of the, the area that you're, that you're most interested in. As I said about funding, um, you, need to, you need to find uh, funding and unfortunately national funding, um, national schemes that you can apply to for arts and humanities PhDs are extraordinarily limited and highly competitive um, and indeed you know, have become um, more limited um, over the last year, unfortunately. Um, so this is often a barrier. Um, but most institutions do have their own um, internal uh, funding schemes, which are also competitive, um, but some have particular eligibility criteria that might support people from local areas um, and, and, uh, or, or from particular backgrounds. If funding is a difficulty, then uh, part-time study models um, are much uh, easier to institute at postgraduate level than they are at undergraduate level. Um, also, you don't necessarily need to be physically present um, for, uh, for much of, um, of, of the time um, because uh, you will be working predominantly independently. Um, and so arrangements can be made um, if you're, you're not actually able to live in the, in, in the city where your, your, your supervisors are. And in due course, um, usually in the second or third year of, um, of your study, um, PhD students often get opportunities to undertake some part time tutoring roles on the undergraduate programmes. I would like to say a few things about uh, the challenges of PhD study. Um, it is um, a marathon piece of work. Uh, and so um, with the, the analogy of, of long distance running, um, there will be uh, times that are more challenging than others. This is perfectly normal, um, but it does pay to, um, to, to make sure that you have a good support network around you, um, that uh, you know, you've spoken to your, uh, your family, your friends, um, in order to, to think about um, how you, you will able to be um, to, to feel supported undertaking this, this large piece of study. And it's also a very good idea um, to uh, get involved in your, um, the postgraduate community at your institution um, and the wider research community. Um, there will usually be all kinds of, uh, of talks and, and, uh, and projects uh, going on that you can, that you can go along to um, and learn from people as, as, as researchers. It's also important to note that over the course of th the three years, 
or four years, uh, the, your actual project may change and develop and uh, end up being something quite different from the proposal that you originally submitted. Um, so um, you know, it, it's, it's as well to be aware of that and to understand that that's a completely normal part of the research process um, and you know and, and to 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 keep an open mind as to how things might change um, as as you develop as as a researcher okay so i'm very happy to answer any questions please do get in touch with me via email um, if i can be of um, of any assistance whatsoever um, please don't hesitate to get in touch thank you very much for your attention I have just recently graduated from the University of Edinburgh. Um, so I'm a current postgraduate student at Trinity College Dublin. Um, so yeah, so I have just recently graduated in July. Um, I studied Russian studies and English literature. It was an MA, it was a Scottish master's at the University of Edinburgh. Um, uh, that meant that I did a year abroad in Russia um, and then that got disrupted by the war. So I then spent the majority of my time in Latvia. Uh, but my undergraduate specialization was Russian literature and then uh, the English literature side, I focused on Northern Irish poetry. Um, and then my dissertation um, was an analysis of the portrayal of deafness in one of Turgenev's short stories, Mumu. Um, so that's just kind of a brief overview of kind of what I started with in undergrad. Um, yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, then this is kind of why I wanted to do postgrads. Um, so I um have been affected by boycotts strikes the war in ukraine covid so although i did four years of undergraduate i really didn't feel like i'd had enough of university life um i really wanted more of that experience and an experience that wasn't going to be interrupted um it was also just kind of a natural decision for me that I wanted to continue studying um a lot of my classmates expressed in my final year that they were kind of ready for a job, that they were ready to be done with studying, that they kind of wanted to move on from education, but I very much felt the opposite, that I wanted to carry on, that I did want to continue research, that I wanted to carry on writing essays, um, and that I had questions that hadn't been answered by my undergraduate, that like, although I had specialisations, I still had things that I wanted to know more about. Um, specifically after my dissertation, um, I'm really passionate about disability and disability in literature. And it's something that I wanted to continue on kind of writing about and researching. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of why I chose my postgrad. Um, and then specifically the war in Ukraine. Um, so the war in Ukraine gave me a lot of perspective. I hadn't realized that over the course of four years, I had actually been talking a lot about conflict in essentially all of my essays. So I specialized in Northern Irish poetry, but I actually looked at poetry of the Troubles, which was the civil conflict here in Belfast um, from the 70s to the 90s. Um, and then all of my essays sort of looked at conflict, war, um, the after effects of war, um, like civil conflict, familial conflict. So conflict I found kind of cropped up at every turn and then the war in Ukraine really sparked something in me. So my final year was kind of all focused on that and kind of the identity politics surrounding it. Um, so I looked at, so I focused on kind of uh, Russian language, Ukrainian poetry in response to the war. Um, I looked at identity politics in terms of the Ukrainian painter Quinji. Um, I, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of why I wanted to do postgrad. Um, and this is a list of kind of what I applied for and my criteria for it. Um, so it was really important that I continue learning Russian language. Um, so I started ab initio at Edinburgh um, and it was really, it's really important for me to continue my level, to continue learning it. Um, so I wanted something that had Russian language classes built into it and to continue that level. I wanted something very obviously focused on Russia, Eastern Europe, that area and that region. 
I wanted to be to be able to include my literary skills um, and I really wanted to. So I'm already had my master's thesis in mind, which isn't actually common for a lot of postgraduate students. So like, don't freak out. Um, so I really wanted to look at Svetlana Alexeyevich's The Unwomanly Face of War. Um, so I knew that that was something already that I really wanted to do. Affordability as well. Um, with postgraduate, you don't get quite as much funding. There's no um, kind of maintenance loan. You get a master's loan, um, but it works quite differently. So um, I knew that I would have to be very financially fiscal this year and I knew I want to, I'd have to be able to afford the course. Um, I really wanted a new location, specifically Europe focused. Um, so I wanted somewhere in Europe or Eastern Europe or um, I was kind of feeling like I was kind of done with Scotland at that point. Not necessarily a bad thing. I love Scotland so much, but I just thought a new location would be good signaling for new studies. Um, for postgrad, I thought it was really important that um, it have a very positive impact on my career prospects. Um, so I really wanted something with um, like a practical or professional option for them. So a lot of these that I have here have like internship modules or like abilities to work with staff or um, just things that I think would help my career and would make a postgraduate worth it. Um, so something that would enhance my career prospects was something that was really important to me. Um, and then obviously I wanted to focus on kind of conflict, um, international relations, politics, um, you know, cultural clashes, that sort of thing. Um, so these are what I applied for. Um, so I applied for the Erasmus International Masters um, in Central Eastern European um, and Asian Central Asian Studies. Um, that is run by Erasmus um, in partnership with the University of Glasgow and Tartu primarily. Um, so that is a two year course that sees you on three or four different campuses across Europe. Um, so I really fancied the look of it. I applied for it. It is the most expensive course on the list that I applied for. Um, and I didn't end up attending because I didn't get a scholarship that I would have needed to afford it. Um, I applied for Vilnius um, and I applied for Helsinki. Um, Vilnius was never really top of my priority list. So it was just something that like kind of fell by the wayside. Um, Helsinki, I ended up not going to Helsinki because they only offered language classes up to B2 and I was already at B2 C1 level and I needed something a bit higher than that personally. Um, my dissertation supervisor put me for a PhD position with Queen Mary uh, in collaboration with the British Library. Um, I went for it, I did a PhD proposal, I had an interview, um, but I obviously didn't get it just because I was just that little bit um, less experienced than a lot of other candidates. I didn't have a postgraduate degree. Um, I applied for Yale, but I decided that America wasn't the right direction for me. I wanted something more Europe and Eastern facing. I applied for Glasgow for a translating course, um, but again, it just wasn't the right location for me. I applied for Bath and again, same thing, it was in translation, but I just didn't want the location. Um, I obviously chose Trinity, so I'm here. This was a slightly different one. So I decided to apply for international peace studies at Trinity College Dublin um, and conflict resolution and reconciliation at Trinity as well. Um, I wanted this because I really thought that the international relations politics side was something that I would like to go into career wise and I wanted to know more of, but that I didn't have the knowledge myself. So I wanted to have that teaching from someone simply because it wasn't something that I really did at my undergraduate level. Um, so I thought that, you know, an international relations um, degree and that sort of thing would obviously help me. It was very conflict um, orientated. Trinity do offer an internship model, module, which I am currently applying for. Um, I mean, you know, I'm Irish, so I'm biased, but I love Dublin. I think it's a gorgeous city. Um, 
it is also affordable for European and UK students. Um, it's about, I think it's 9,000 euro, which is 7,000 pounds. Um, so mainland UK masters, it, it, is, it is much cheaper. Um, and they are allowing me to audit Russian classes. So I am taking uh, Russian language classes at the appropriate level. I'm just in a different school and I just take them for the crack essentially. So I don't have to do the homework. I don't have assessments for them. I just rock up and I, I can learn whatever I like, but I just don't have assessments for them. Um, I also applied for Queen's University Belfast. They have a course in translation for Russian. Um, and then they also have a course in conflict transformation. Um, and again, they had everything I wanted, but Trinity just really sold me on it. And then Sterling have a course that is run in collaboration with the UN. Um, and I got offered a scholarship on merit for that one. Um, and that one has included a guaranteed internship with the UN. Um, and it looked amazing, but it just wasn't the right location for me. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm obviously now doing the International Peace Studies MPhil with Trinity College Dublin. Um, while this isn't Russian based or Eastern European based, um, they have a lot of room really to kind of mold your postgraduate degree. So I am specializing in Russia. So I'm doing international peace studies with a specialization in Russia, Russian foreign policy and the war in Ukraine. Um, so this semester I'm writing lots of essays. One of them is on uh, the just war theory and the legitimization of the invasion of Ukraine uh, using right to protect language and human humanitarian intervention language. Um, I'm then writing about the memorialization of the Soviet period with uh, structures and statues in Eastern Europe, specifically in Bulgaria. Um, and then I'm doing a gender war and peace module, which is looking at um, the role of women in the war in Ukraine, specifically looking at female combatants. Um, so I'm essentially taking the modules and then gearing them towards what I'm interested in. Obviously, as I've said before, they are letting me take Russian classes. So I'm in the final year C1 language classes. I'm doing um, reading and writing this semester and then I'll do oral and listening next semester. Um, it really is giving me that kind of international relations, international law, politics and philosophy side of things that I would really like to know, but I just didn't take it undergraduate. Um, and they're very aware that like I haven't, don't have previous exper experience and they've been great at just kind of leading me through that. It's a one year course. Um, and then for the applications for everything um, I did, um, academic CV, um, which is slightly different from a professional. You just have to write a lot more about your education than you would in a normal professional CV. Um, I then uploaded like a letter of motivation, which is essentially the same as what you would write for applying to like UCAS, um, but just like a bit higher level essentially um and then i had two academic references so my first one was my dissertation supervisor um so i'd taken four of her modules across the four years she was supervising my dissertation and um, so i saw her on like a weekly basis so she knew me very 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 well um and then i also used my english tutor personal tutor um I didn't know him as well. I'd never taken any of his classes. I'd only ever really had like semesterly meetings with him just to check in. Um, but what I actually did was I sent him some examples of my best work. I gave him like a background of like why I was applying for the things that I wanted to apply for, how they fitted in with my previous background. And he was actually able to write me some really amazing references. Um, and like, professors are very up for writing new references like please go and ask them if you're scared to I was terrified to 
but they really helped me understand kind of what I was applying for um so they really honestly like they actually told me about half of the courses I applied for um so I would really highly recommend going to just speak to some of your teachers and just being like what what do you know is available what's out there this is what I'd like to do but I just don't know what is the right direction for me um that sort of thing um and then yeah so future plans so I'm only a couple of years ahead of you if not a year ahead of you um so Trinity um have a internship program um associated with my master's so I am currently undertaking that um I will be in September 2024 interning for the UN um just the department's a bit unsure at the minute so I'll be spending three months in Geneva from September 2024 to December 2024 um all of the applicants for my specific master's get access to this internship module trinity um specifically with internships at master's level are very very proactive about it so i know um some students um who are being sent to for example bosnia and herzegovina i know people are being sent to east timor people are being sent to south africa people are being sent to argentina chile el salvador el salvador um there was an option to go to Palestine, but with the current political situation, I don't think that will be happening. Um, but I really can't recommend them more. I think they offer a really great internship program. Um, and then after that, I am currently in the midst of applying for uh, and creating a PhD proposal. Um, so I'm looking at kind of that further steps in my academic career. And I'm also looking at entering kind of the NGO international politics and policy sphere. Um, so, yeah, so I don't really have things sorted yet, but I'm getting there. Um, yeah, that's kind of me. If anybody has any questions about the process or anything, I've been through it really recently. So you're more than I'm very happy to chat. Thank you so much. I think you under you underspoke about yourself so much. You have so much experience. You know about so many courses around the world. Um, it was a very valuable talk. So thank you so much, Alana. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. And whilst you guys start writing questions, if you have any for anyone, um, I'd also like to quickly say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, and especially a big thank you to the speakers. Um, and yeah, it's, we also just want to apologize for not being able to play Sarah's video. So we will definitely get that up on the website um, as a separate video to the recording of this. Um, so yeah, please do check it out because she has a lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, yeah, I want to especially say thank you to Alana for going through every single master's that you applied for. Um, not just masters just all the courses because I didn't know about any of them actually um, so just going through all of them was sort of like a whistle stop tour around the world I really appreciated it um, and similarly Rachel for going through all the different kinds of um, industries and spheres that your current our current undergraduate degrees can lead us into um, some of us don't even think about international business or other things like that so um, it's great that you managed to show us all the opportunities that are available um, I think it's quite common for language students to limit themselves and think oh I must become a translator or teacher but it just shows there's so much out there um, so yeah thank you very much um, there we go we have a question in the chat so I will stop talking <laughs> okay um, so I applied to quite a lot of courses. Is this the norm for masters and postgrad? I would say no. I was very conflicted on what route to go, whether to go Russian, literature, international politics. So I applied for a lot of different types of courses. So I applied for um, translating in terms of Russian. I then applied for international politics courses. Um, and then I also applied for like English literature courses. I had those three specific types of courses that I wanted to apply for. Um, 
And then also at the time when things were looking for applications, um, I just wasn't sure. So I thought it would be better to kind of spread my net wide and then make a choice rather than being cut off because I didn't apply for things. Um, I would say most most of my uh, classmates from undergraduate who are now doing a postgrad, they had more of an intuitive sense of where they wanted to go. Um, so my friend who was studying translating in Glasgow, she knew she wanted to do that. It was the only course she applied for and she's now there. Um, I know one girl who is now doing journalism in uh, UCL. Um, again, that was the only course she applied for. She knew she wanted to do it and that's what she got. Uh, um, I know a couple of other people who applied for maybe three, four, five um I would definitely be the exception I applied for a lot more than most people would um but my policy was spreading my net wide and then choosing from there um and then is the Erasmus International Masters available for us still now post Brexit when should we start uh so I'm Irish I'll have an Irish passport um so my application was slightly different I know that it is available, but I think the fees may be different for you, unfortunately, as UK students. So I was being offered um, 7,000 euro a year for two year course, so 14,000 euro total. I think that may be higher for you guys, unfortunately, um, just because you're not part of the EU. I would check that though. I'm not entirely certain simply because it was a different process for me because I am an EU citizen um i'm not sure in, in all honesty um and then when should we start looking and applying for masters um so i began my first application i sent in january if you are looking to apply for helsinki their applications end in january um they are the only ones that i applied for that had that of an much of an early cut off date um so Helsinki was due in January. Um, the Ma in Erasmus International one was due in February. And then most cutoff dates are kind of May-ish time. Um, I wanted to get all of my applications done before things like my dissertation were due and before uh, like exams kept cre creeping up. So I got all of mine done by kind of March time because my dissertation was due in April and then in May I had exams. Um, but I also had people applying in like April and May and they got in. Um, so it's just up for you guys. And then also if you know where you want to go, I mean, you can apply as early as you want because they look at them on a rolling basis typically. Um, so for me, I got acceptances for places that still hadn't closed their applications. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered that question. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, I put oh. it in the chat, but I strongly recommend looking at Find a Master's to, to figure out what's out there in terms of master's degrees. It's a really good resource. You can do keyword searches. You can limit yourself. You, you know, you can you can do geographic searches, um, and there are so many things out there that you probably haven't thought of. Um, very much supporting what what Alana was saying about spreading the net wide. Um, this is one way of figuring out what kinds of options there are in fields that might not even occur to have occurred to you. So that's a great resource that I always recommend to students who are interested in master's degrees. Um, Rachel, can I just ask, um, you said at one point, one of the master's degrees, um, you can choose like different languages to translate between, you don't, doesn't necessarily have to be to English, but do you have to be a native speaker in one of those languages or can you choose like your second languages in both? The rule of thumb is that you have to translate into your native language. So um, for someone in mm -hmm. your position, you could do Russian to English, you could do Spanish to English, but you wouldn't be allowed on that specific program to do the reverse. Okay. 
think we'll give it another half minute. And if we don't have too many other questions, then we can end the event a little bit early. Um, but also um, people will have contacts. Um, so if they do have any questions, they can obviously reach out. They can also reach out to us via the email and then we can sort of, you can use us to di indirectly contact people if you need. Um, yeah, if anyone does have a question and they're in the pr process of writing it, you can just unmute yourself. I think there's few enough of us <laughs> to do that. Um, but I'm under the impression that may not be the case. Um, um, just to advertise Sarah a bit more as well, um, her talk talks more about PhDs and um, focuses on that. So it's a bit different from what we've already heard. So just to promote her talk again that we will upload and I will send it all to you as well. Um, it is something different that if you're looking to do a PhD, it might be very useful for you. And she's from the University of Leeds. So yeah, a different view as well. All over England and yeah. Ireland <laughs> today. So yeah, that's great. Well, also Alana, why don't you represent Scotland as well while you're at it? Because <laughs> you did your undergrad there. So yeah. Um I I think now um I'll end the recording. Um so for those that have been asynchronous asynchronously attending, thank you very much.